So I do not typically make generalizations. However, I feel really confident in saying this. I believe that each one of us is really hoping for the best Christmas. I think that we want this Christmas season to just be the best. Now, the only problem is, what does that mean? I think that each one of us may have a different idea of what the best Christmas looks like for, you know, for our family and for ourselves. Though, I do think if I say the word Christmas, there are certain images that will come to all of our minds. I think uh, there's probably a tree that you think of. Um, There might be this sort of overweight jolly fellow that wears red and white fur. Questionable choice. But anyway, you know, that might be in your mind. Um, I also think a lot of us would envision something that maybe looks like this, right? The gifts. I think that there are some people who actually um, measure or look at how good is Christmas by how many of these things are purchased. Um, there are people who look at our buying trends and who wait anxiously to see what Black Friday and Cyber Monday look like. And I will tell you that those people, they're very happy this year. Um, you guys had record spending. Let me just tell you, on Cyber Monday alone, we all spent $9.4 billion. Exactly, right? But I also know that some of you don't wait to Cyber Monday. You start early. And so for those of us who started our shopping on November 1, um, we spent from November 1 to December 2nd, 81 and a half billion dollars on gifts. Now, what were some of those top gifts? Well, anything that has Frozen 2 on it. Um, Also, the Nintendo Switch and the Apple laptop. So if that happens to be on your wish list, very good chance someone bought it for you. But here's the thing. As much as we say, gosh, what do you want? I want the best Christmas. If I turn around and then ask, okay, tell me, what is it that is one of the biggest stressors for you at Christmas time? There are lots of studies, lots of surveys that have gone out asking that very question. And on every single one of them near the top or at the top is gift buying. Because there is this stress that is related to gift buying. Uh, Either you want to get the right thing or there's this pull to overspend. And so, you know, this brings about stress for us. However, I don't want you to think that I think gifts are bad. I don't. And you know, if you've bought me one, don't return it. I'll take it. But here's the thing. I really actually believe that our, our motivation behind gift buying is good. I think when you go out and buy a gift, just like when I go out and buy a gift, the reason why I do it is because I want someone in my life to be happy. I want my kids to be happy. I want my spouse to be happy. I want my coworkers to be happy. I want the crazy, weird, secret Santa person I barely know to be happy with whatever it is that I got. So the motivation behind getting gifts is not a bad thing, but the stress around having to spend money and get the gifts does create a problem for us. And I think that this is sort of the tension that we see. We have um, the message of the world would say, do you want to be happy? Let me tell you how to be happy. Why don't you go out and buy a bunch of gifts and spend $81.5 billion? And then you have the message of the church, the message of God that says, I want you to be happy, but I believe that happiness comes in a different way. So what if today we just look beyond the bow? What if we look beyond the message and the story that the world tells us? That's actually what our series is about, this Beyond series where we're looking beyond ourselves, beyond gifts, beyond borders, beyond expectations. We want to have the best Christmas. We believe that you can. 
but we also believe that you have to look at it in a different way. So we are going to look at the story of Joseph. And if you have your Bible, I would love for you to join along. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 1. Now, to know something about Joseph, you have to understand that he was well immersed in his culture. He was living the story that the world told him he should live. And there was nothing wrong with that. Now, we don't know much about Joseph's father, but chances are he was following in the footsteps the career path that his father had. Joseph wanted to get married, have kids. Hopefully, some of those kids would be guys because boys would be able to follow in his footpath. And that, that was the story that Joseph wanted, um, wanted to live out until God stepped in to his story and asked him to look at it differently. So let's start reading Matthew chapter 1 verse 18. This is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. Okay, let's just stop there for a second. He is pledged to be married. And I just want to tell you right now, I am all about the engagement thing right now. Okay? This story spoke to me. I am all about it because my older daughter just got engaged. Yay! They're here, so clap. Thank you. Three weeks ago, yes, we are very excited. I have fully stepped into the role of mother of the bride, even though I don't really know exactly how that plays out, but I am learning. Um, what I also have learned is that there are, you know, because things are different now than like when I got married, um, there's websites. Websites that when you plug in your little information, they will tell you everything you ever needed to know about getting married. They would tell you what you need to do every moment of every day from the moment you get engaged until the moment you're married. They will tell you everything you have to do. You, they will tell you the things you never knew that you needed to do. And um, you know, I'm a planner, so you would think that this would be great for me. My daughter's a planner. I have anxiety, okay? There is so much more stuff around engagement. So for those of you who have walked this path before, I would like to say that I would like to create a support group so that you can pray for me for the next 201 days. So <laughs> engagement is awesome. It's wonderful. Now, it's, it was different for Joseph and Mary, it was more simple. They actually had sort of a three-step process. Um, what we call engagement, their engagement was a little different. So this first sort of step of engagement meant that the parents decided, hey, these two guys and gals should be um, married um, at some point in time. Let's go ahead and make the arrangement and say, yeah, this is a good match. And so that engagement period could have lasted for years and years. And we do not know how long their engagement period lasted. But then the second phase is the betrothal. Just love that word, right? And this is actually what we're looking at now. This betrothal time was they were officially married as far as culture would say. However, Mary still lived at home with her father, her parents. Joseph would have le lived on his own. Um, so they didn't live together, but they were, in the eyes of culture and the law, married. Okay, this is a commitment together. And then the third step was the actual marriage where Mary would leave her home and go and start to live with Joseph. And this is where the honeymoon would happen if you get my drift. Okay, so let's keep reading. But before they came together, before the marriage honeymoon part, okay, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law, and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. Okay, so they are betrothed. They're committed to one another in the eyes of culture and the law. They are connected. They are together. And Mary turns up pregnant. This is a problem. Joseph, it says, was 
faithful to the law. Some translations would say he was righteous, which meant he knew what culture had to say, he knew what the laws were, and he was going to follow them. He was a rule follower. So Joseph has two options. He can publicly divorce her, which basically uh, makes sure everybody knows that she's an adulterer, she is going to be labeled for the rest of her life, and this would cause great disgrace on her and her family. Her, his second option is to divorce her quietly, which means get a couple of witnesses, um, make the agreement that they are now no longer together, let her go off on her own, let her situation play out, she can leave, she can do whatever she wants. And so Joseph says, this is what I'm going to do. He has no door number three. Now, if we're going to put ourselves in Joseph's um, steps, this had to be painful. Remember, if they had been engaged for years and years, I mean, he might have even just sort of grown up next door to her. He knows Mary. He wants to marry her. He wants his life to play out with children. I mean, this is his plan for his best life. He doesn't want this to happen, but he knows the expectations. He knows what he has to do, so he makes up his mind until God comes in and says, ah, there's actually a door at number three. If you're willing to look beyond what the world tells you and to look at things differently. Let's keep reading. But after he had considered this, meaning considering his options, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Okay, so Joseph's made his decision. He knows what he has to do. The angel comes in and says, here's actually door number three. And the angel says something that would have sparked a memory in Joseph. He says, Son of David. Now again, Joseph knew the laws. Joseph knew the scriptures. He knew that there was a prophecy of a Messiah that was coming through the line of David. So the very fact that the angel said, Son of David, this would have reminded him of what we read in Isaiah 7, 14. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. So Joseph has this best life all planned out, but God comes in and changes the narrative. This is the tension that I believe that we live in for Christmas, right? We want happiness, and the world comes in and says, let me tell you the story about happiness. You get gifts, you get to do all these things, you need a lot of stuff, and then you're gonna be happy. And the God, God comes in and says, no, 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 I have a totally different story. Yes, I, I want you to be happy, but you're gonna be happy if you are holy. And I'm gonna show you because I came in with choosing a couple that had nothing from nowhere. I came into the world in obscurity with none of that stuff. And yet that is where the hope of the world is found. So I wonder if for the next few minutes as we've gathered here today, if we would consider the Christmas story. If we would think about the story that the world tells us and maybe be willing to flip it, maybe be willing to look beyond to the story that God has to tell us, an alternative way to look at Christmas. So let's think, what is one of the first tensions that we hold on to during Christmas? Well, the world says happiness comes in a box. God says, happiness is found in a manger. How many of you grew up with the story of how the Grinch stole Christmas? Yes, of course, actually you all did because there are a thousand versions of it, but I grew up with the right one, the one from 1966, the original one. But whatever it is, you know the story. Here is the Grinch, and he's miserable, and he wants everyone else to be miserable. And so he looks down on Whoville with all these happy little people, 
And he sees that all these happy little people have trees and presents and food and all this fantastic stuff. And he goes, well, you know what? To make them miserable, I'm going to go and I'm going to steal all their stuff. And if I take away their stuff, then they're going to be miserable like me. Now, it may seem silly, but I think the world likes to plant that kind of seed in our minds that says, you know what? If you don't have all the stuff, you're not going to be happy. Right? That's what the world says. But God says, you know what? I came in the world with nothing to a couple that had nothing in the middle of nowhere. I came into the world in obscurity, and that is where the greatest happiness came from. So what if this year we chose to, instead of being filled, we chose to be empty? What if we found a way to get rid or give away our stuff? What if we took our gift budget, and I know you all have your gift budget, you've probably run it by Dave Ramsey, and you probably have it in little envelopes because you're really awesome, but what if we took that gift budget and said, you know what, this year, I want to take a percentage of that, and I want to just give it away. Maybe it's just 10% this year. Maybe it's half of your gift budget, and you decided to just give it away to someone else. Now, I will tell you that this church is actually really good at doing that. We have angel tree and Christmas miracles as a way to give presents to other people. And um, the Christians that love Jesus more because they came to 930, and they took all of the tags, so we don't have any more tags for Christmas miracles, but that's okay because I know that you love Jesus too. Um, I, there are so many ways that we can find others, those who are in need, those who don't have, and we can give away what we have, choose to be empty, and just ask God to fill it, fill us with something else. Now, what is another tension that we hold on to? Well, the world says happiness comes from receiving, but God says happiness comes from giving. And we're all bombarded, we know this, bombarded with commercials that tell us the glories of jewelry and cars and all that stuff. And those are great, but you know what? You're too smart because you don't cry at those commercials. No, you cry at the commercials where the son comes home from the military in the middle of the night and they finally get to have Christmas together. You cry at the commercials where the little child takes something out of her own basket and gives it to the, the sad person who seems lonely, right? We know better. The world may say that happiness comes from the cars and the jewelry and all this, but we know that God says, no, actually happiness comes from giving what we have away. Now, this year, why don't we focus instead of on the getting but the giving. Let's try something totally different, maybe that we've never tried before. Um, my family, we um, are trying something brand new this year. We decided to write thank you notes and to just randomly give it to people that we run into during, like while we're running errands. And so my daughter and I did this and kind of had a lot of fun with it, actually. Um, we just, you know, I just took a card, I just wrote a thank you note, thank you for working hard, being part of our community, wishing you joy and hope this Christmas season. And I tagged, I just taped a $5 bill inside of it, and then as we were running errands, I was like, okay, Lord, show me some people to give it to. And it was actually so much fun. Um, we ran into a young lady who uh, turns out it was her first day on the job at a fast food restaurant, was having a little bit of a rough time trying to figure out how to sell us applesauce, but that's okay. Uh, and, you know, we just looked at her and I kind of look at my daughter. My daughter's like, yeah, she's one, right? And so we just like pull it out and she's like, hey, you know, we just want to thank you and we're so glad that you're working here and just Merry Christmas, you know? And uh, then when, um, Alex at the gas station, we ran into Betty and Annie, we decided to go by the Goodwill and just thank them for being there. And so anyway, you know what? And it really wasn't about us. Like, I don't even think it has nothing to do 
with me. It has nothing to do with the card we wrote. It, it was the fact that God was working in that. And I will tell you, I got way more out of that than anything that, um, you know, the person we gave the thank you note um, did. It was so good because we know that God tells us what's important, right? So the third tension that I think we hold on to um, during this Christmas season is that the world will say your worth is measured in presence. But God says your worth is measured in presence, in time, in being alongside in one of us. Um, what's so interesting is that the happiness, I want you to think just for a second, what was, the, what was your favorite gift you've ever gotten? Just have that in your mind, okay. Now let me ask you, was it really the gift that made you feel so good? Or was it the fact that someone wanted to show you that you were worth it? And that's why they gave you the gift, because um, it showed their love for you. It showed that they listened to you, that you were valued. That's what I believe God says around here. He says, you know what, your worth is measured in presence, in, in time. So what if this year we chose presence over presence? We chose to give our time away to somebody. A few years ago, um, our family did this because our kids are getting older, we're going everywhere, and it's really hard to get anybody, you know, get us all together at one time. And so we gave... Um, a family gift of the 12 months of Christmas. And it was a big box, and inside that big box were 12 small boxes, and each box represented an activity we were going to do each month during the year. So we got to look forward to the fact that we know, like, in August, we're going to get together and go to the Galleria and, you know, ice skate. And some of the things were kind of big, fun things, like I fly, and some of them were just little. It was just time together. And we got to anticipate that and think about that through the whole year, and it was so important. Now, let me just tell you, I am not about to tell you that presents, the gifts, the things that you have already bought are evil or bad, not at all. That is not what I'm telling you, but I want you to be really careful and say, what story am I listening to? Am I believing that all of the things I'm buying, all the things that the world says I'm gonna find my happiness in, is that what I'm holding on to, or Am I understanding that my happiness actually comes from the thing that we see in our Advent wreath? That the love and the joy and the peace that I want so desperately is not gonna come in a box. It's gonna come from Jesus. So just to make sure we all understand, I want us to learn from one of the greatest theologians, and we're gonna watch the screen. So I believe that we can actually have the very best Christmas this year. But maybe to do it, it means looking beyond the gift to the giver, the one who came as a baby to a nothing couple in a nowhere place in obscurity to give us the joy and the peace and the love that we really want. I'm gonna invite you to stand as we sing our final song today. And of course, if you need prayer at this time, I want you to know I'll be down here on this side. Bishop Hayes will be on this side. We would love to pray with you. But my prayer is that each one of us, we do have the best Christmas because Jesus came to give it to us.